and who is wearing a purple shirt, looking sharp, is also my personal hero because when I had a migraine yesterday, he let me go and lie down in his room in the dark, even though he had work to do, give him a hand. He's a legend. <laughs> he is a gentleman and a scholar, and he's going to give a fabulous talk to us today. Um, his many talents include the fact that he is an ambassador for open knowledge. Um, he is the national GovHack site coordinator, running over 30 GovHack sites across Australia and New Zealand, which is totally awesome. And he's a proud advocate of open data. He'll be giving us open opportunities, opening up for a better world. Please welcome Richard. Thank you, Morgan. Firstly, it truly is an honour to be here today in front of you all. You're all such talented and passionate individuals. It's been so amazing to see such terrific talks while I've been here. I've learned a lot. I've even learnt uh, to build the first parts of a Russian nuclear submarine. So thanks, uh, Scott Huntley, for the tips there. <clears throat> it's so great to have the Open Source Developers Conference here in my home state of Tasmania and in beautiful Hobart. I reside in Tasmania's northwest coast uh, in a beachside town called Somerset. That's about 10 minutes northwest of Burnie for those people who are unfamiliar uh, with our beautiful island. And uh, to drive back, it's around about four and a half hours from uh, this very location. I know that we aren't at the end of the conference yet, but that doesn't mean that we can't show our gratitude towards the amazing conference organizers. Tim and Morgan and the volunteers. I think these awesome people all deserve a, uh, a very strong and hearty round of applause. <laughs> it really has been a, a very fun, inspiring and informative event. Uh, I know first, first, first hand the time and effort and organisation required it takes to put on events. So well done each and every one of you. You thoroughly deserve it. Looking around the room at the greatness before me, I am humbled to be speaking here amongst community leaders of open software, open hardware, open data, open science, and open government. I originally started out as a front-end designer and developer many, many years ago, before branching into project management and management consultancy for corporations and organizations. I'm an Open Knowledge Ambassador for the, and on the communications team at CCAN. That's the other CCAN, by the way. Uh, however, some of you may know me from the roles I've had uh, through GovHack uh, over the last few years, or maybe you've even seen my TED talk. How many here have actually been involved in GovHack in any sort of way in the past? <laughs> my goodness, okay, that's, that's, a, that's a fair effort there. I should just point out too that we have the fantastic uh, Kathy Reid. Hopefully a lot of you got to go and see her uh, terrific talk yesterday. Uh, she has been uh, the standout uh, GovHack coordinator for 2015, running GovHack Geelong for the very, very first time. Um, and, uh, and that was actually a standout success, it really was. I would have said it whether Cathy was here or not, and I think the other organisers know just how amazing Cathy is, so, so well done, Cathy. <laughs> I think my laptop has got a life. Uh, for the benefit of those who don't completely understand GovHack, it's an open data hackathon uh, and competition. So it's, in fact, it's actually Australia's largest hackathon. So over a 46 hour period, digital creatives, makers and developers just like yourselves come together and create awesome projects using open government data. So teams compete for local and also for, for national prizes. And uh, the prize pool is actually quite significant. For the last two years, we've also held the GovHack Red Carpet Awards, which is a gala event where national winners are announced with great fanfare and in the presence of some quite influential people. This year, we flew 100 representatives from lucky teams all around Australia and New Zealand to attend our Red Carpet Awards. GovHack is a terrific platform for showcasing the possibilities of open data and open government. It also helps raise public awareness on the benefits of openness and transparency within government, uh, something that Michael Cordova would like to see more of, I'm sure. <laughs> Is he here? No, no okay. <laughs> this year, GovHack events were held across, all across Australia and New Zealand. 
So I'm fortunate. I have the privilege as the GovHack National Site Coordinator of leading and coordinating this amazing group of volunteer coordinators, just like Kathy. Now, these people are legends. They manage all aspects of the local events. So imagine sort of putting, I guess, a little bit like this on, uh, but in 30 locations simultaneously. Um, and of course, often uh, these are non-stop 46-hour events, so people tend to camp out and you need to keep them uh, fed and you know, watered and all those things. So this year, there was close to 2,000 people who directly, were directly involved in GovHack as participants, volunteers, mentors, and sponsors. For me, the open movement is really quite simple. It's all about sharing. <laughs> sharing the best ideas, methods, and innovations with the rest of the world. Being able to work together and collaborate on making the world the very, very best it can be. To always strive for the best possible outcome. To never settle. I see openness as where opportunity and collaboration collide. Today I'm going to tell you some personal stories about my journey along the path to openness and how I arrived here in front of you today. Hopefully these stories, you'll uncover the lessons that I've learned and you'll be able to assist you in embracing new opportunities for yourselves and your open communities. My talk today is broken down into four simple themes. Opportunity, failure, scarcity, and collaboration. If openness is where opportunity, sorry, ice. <laughs> if openness is where opportunity and collaboration collide, it makes sense to firstly be able to identify and seize the opportunities when they do arise. Now, seizing opportunities is a careful balance of risk and reward. I first began to seize opportunities and walk the risk and reward tightrope back in high school. I went to Kings Meadows High School, which was a public school, it still is a public school, <laughs> uh, situated in Launceston in Tasmania. The year was 1990. Apple had released the Macintosh a few years earlier, but in schools, at least public ones at the time, the only common computers were BBC microcomputers. And of course, by today's standards, these were pretty macro microcomputers. Halfway through each lunch break, the more inquisitive of us that believed that knowledge was power took the long walk to the BBC microcomputer lab. Now, this was situated on the third floor in the building, probably the furthest away from the lunching school population as you could possibly get. I believe that this was just in case there was an uncontained burst of knowledge from the lab, ensuring the rest of the lunching school population would remain unaffected allowing them to continue eating their TikTok biscuits and swapping Tarzos from chip packets in complete and utter safety. Back then, I would leave my spot on the handball court to go off and learn to word process, of all things. My masterpiece at the time was a word process document of aviation abbreviations that I would have copied from the glossaries of all my avi aviation books. I know, what an amazing life I led. <laughs> Along with most 12-year-olds at the time, I was certain I was going to become a fighter pilot. After all, the movie Top Gun had been released only a few years earlier. As a side note, for those not old enough to endure those early word processes, it really was akin to writing HTML, with beginning and closing tags with very, very minimal styling that was limited to things like underline, extra wide letters, and they were really cool centering text and even putting in tabs if you dared. This story leads me to my first point on opportunities. You really need to be true to yourself. Sometimes there can be a cost associated with embracing opportunities. This could be financial, time, or in my case, a handball and vitamin D deficiency cost, sorry. <laughs> you really need to weigh up the risk versus re potential rewards and learn to ignore the opinions of others. Your life is yours. Don't let the opinions of others inhibit your ability to seize opportunities when they present themselves. Be true to yourself. After all, there is only one you. Don't be ashamed to own it. Openness is all about seizing the opportunities, seizing the open doors of opportunity. 
as you will see, sometimes this can take a quite a literal form. After hacking away at my, my many, many lunch hours and my word process masterpiece on the BBC, something was about to happen that would change my world forever. It wasn't girls, by the way. Back in 1991, there was a huge budget for IT. There wasn't a huge budget for IT-related school equipment. There wasn't a single Apple Macintosh at my school. Microsoft Windows was still in its infancy, and would remain so, some would say, for several decades. This was all about to change. Coles Supermarkets had an Apples for Students uh, competition, a promotion whereby parents could relinquish their Coles dockets by giving them to the school office. Here they were collected and given to the school administrative staff, which I'm pretty sure gave them the resources they needed to effectively profile each and every parent, CSI style, from their weekly grocery list. Of course, I'm sure that they only kept the metadata of each docket, right? Yeah. yeah. After, the after the data mining and parent profiling was complete, <laughs> the school would give the dockets back to Cole Supermarkets which, by the way, until that year, were actually known as Coles New World. So this might be a new thing for some people who are younger. After reaching around about 100,000 or more in, in dockets, Coles would provide the school with free Apple equipment and software. If it wasn't for that competition, there simply would not have been a computer with a GUI and a mouse in my high school. And that's, that's just how it would have been. My passion for technology, design, and user experience that would play such an important role in my future may not have eventuated. Now, like most kids in high school, I had my share of high school romances. But really, it was the Mac Classic in beige with its 9-inch 512 by 342 pixel monochrome screen and style writer inkjet printer and mouse that really, really stole my heart. And those, that pixel resolution is frightening when you think of what you've got on your phones at the moment. Being able to print fonts, actual different typefaces for the very first time, and being able to see them on screen as the same as they looked in print was truly amazing. I mean, wow. The future had arrived. For me, this represented an opportunity like no other, an end to handwriting assignments and first drafts. From that day forward, I never wrote a first draft. My lunchtime spent on the BBC microcomputers meant that my average typing speed was okay. And I was ready to embrace the future with both hands. However, that lonely Macintosh was the only Mac in the entire school. And so, out of the, so an out of the ordinary machine such as this pedigree wasn't even allowed to congregate in with the labs of BBC microcomputers and typewriters. And yes, we had labs of typewriters back then. They were electric, though. It had its own little oasis in the confines of the school library with a librarian who wasn't intimidated by Macintosh. And this is probably an important point because most staff at the time were very, very intimidated by it. You'd think it the opposite, but uh, especially the computing staff at the time, they hated those things. Each day after school, I would spend quality time with the Mac, delighting in discoveries like the Wingdings font, which really was the great-great-granddaddy of today's emoji. <laughs> After the, uh, it was with great delight that I found that by using a combination of option and shift keys, I could unlock a hidden set of characters with, in fonts like dots and degree symbols and trademark symbols. For me, it truly was an amazing and enlightened time. As the only student in the school who took a stand never to write a first draft again, I was fortunate that I persuaded the teachers to allow me to go to the library to work on my assignments in, while I was in class while the other poor souls were all writing and erasing and tipexing their handwritten work. It was great when in class time I could go and type up assignments on the Macintosh, but as you well know, there is much more work to be expected uh, than what's just done in class time. To many other students, this may have been a stumbling block, and they may have reconsidered their oaths sworn over pencil shavings, erasers, and whiteout to never write a single assignment ever again. Always looking for opportunities, this minor setback started my journey on exploring the freedom that comes with embracing open, as you all see. After school each night, the cleaners would politely kick me out after vacuuming the library and locking the doors around about 7 p.m. 
Looking back as a parent now, I realise that either my parents wanted me to become a missing child, uh, didn't really like me all that much, or really trusted me and the neighbourhood at the time. Uh, maybe that was the reason why they got me started with martial arts at a very early age. One occasion I had a very big assignment due the next day, and it needed more time than the 7pm library lockdown could provide. So I hatched a plan. After all the staff left and the students waiting in the library for buses to take them to their remote towns had gone, I would be alone in the library. Now, this was actually quite common, of course. I would take the Mac to a room off the library that was discovered in a previous recon mission to not have active motion sensors. <laughs> I would set the Mac up and start writing jet printer on the desk and through my powers of invisibility and with the small help of a pile of unused desks in the corner, I would hide myself in that room and continue, continue using the little Mac until uh, once the, co the coast was clear. I keep getting ice. <laughs> once the cleaner had finished the daily routine of cleaning the library, they would leave the library, activate the security, and lock the doors. Then, and only then, would I be able to rise from my hidden desk like a phoenix from the ashes, <clears throat> and continue my assignment on the Mac and print it ready for submission. Well, the plan worked. A few hours later, the assignment was complete and printing was done. I needed an exit, and I couldn't leave the room as that would set off the security. Fortunately, it was this moment when my path to openness began. I used the opportunity of an unlocked and open window to first throw out my bag and jump from the first story down to freedom. If that was a closed window, it would have been a completely different story. The next day, I arrived to school and headed back to the library and quickly closed the window. Fortunately, nobody had discovered that it was open, and fortunately, it hadn't rained as well, and moved the Mac from the room back to its rightful spot. I can't remember exactly, but I'm sure that I must have had a, a good excuse for the staff as to why I was moving this Mac uh, back to its rightful place. You see, openness, even in its very simple form, leads to opportunity. Fortunately, nobody found out about my shenanigans. And I guess it really wasn't a break and enter, more like a don't break and leave, so I'm pretty sure it wouldn't hold up in court. After that episode, my parents decided that instead of their son being out in the dark at all hours and on the street shooting up word processing and dealing in fonts and shuffle puck, that they would purchase a Mac Classic 2 from Maya from a sum of $1,499, which at the time was a lot of money. I still remember having the conversation with my mother prior to the purchase. I was telling her that the Mac Classic 2 that we were getting had a 16 megahertz processor that was twice as fast as the Mac Classic 1 I had willingly imprisoned myself for. Her response that was she was concerned that it would be too fast for her and that the extra speed was probably unnecessary. Fortunately, I didn't mention the huge 40 megabyte hard drive and, or four megabytes of RAM, otherwise she thought uh, that it was simply too extra extravagant for common people such as ourselves. Fast forward a few years later to 1994. I was required to have some non-life-threatening surgery, which I'm told through really good sources that if you're going to have surgery, this is definitely the best kind. <laughs> Prior to the surgery, I went to the 1994 equivalent of Wikipedia, which was the City Library. I managed to find everything they had on how barcodes worked, which conveniently and cost-effectively fitted onto a single A4 page, therefore only costing me 10 cents for the privilege. I would take this holy grail of barcode genesis with me to hospital with my trusty Mac Classic 2. Post-surgery, I sat up with my Mac on my tray table and hacked away at the Apple HyperCard software, which at the time was quite revolutionary, revolutionary for enabling hypertext, which we all know about. It also had its own neat scripting language called HyperScript. Three days in hospital later, I turned a single A4 sheet on barcodes from the town library into 30,000 lines of code, or hyperscript, <laughs> that would create different types of barcodes from the input you gave it. This is where I found that with a little planning and the right mindset, you can turn out a less than ideal situation, I won't even go where they operated on me, by the way, into an opportunity, <laughs> but, just, <laughs> but just be sure to be on the lookout for those opportunities. 
I have one more childhood story of risk and opportunity to share with you. This time I was 14 year, years old and not, enough to, not old enough to get a job at Woolworths, or Rolf Foss, as we like to call it in northern Tasmania. <laughs> not content with waiting a whole year to turn 15, I decided to start my own business. I discovered that Cadbury was selling chocolates, uh, seconds, roses and dairy milk selections chocolates, through a warehouse in the Launceston Airport. I saved what pocket money I had to purchase my first box and convinced my mother to drive me over there to purchase one. They were supposed to be around five kilograms of chocolates, about this big, uh, although it was always a few kilos over than that, and the cost of a leave at the time was around about $18. Back then, speculating $18 on the possibility of starting a profitable confectionery distribution empire was a big deal for a 14-year-old. I definitely could have bought a Transformer, and, and my poor Grimlock at home was getting very lonely waiting for his fellow Dinobots to arrive. I bought my first chocolate box, along with some cellophane bags I'd sourced from a craft shop. I sorted the chocolates and weighed them into 200 gram lots, and put them into bags and tied them up with some curling ribbon. I then proceeded to go door to door around Launceston and Devonport selling chocolates. I was the 14 year old Heisenberg of door to door chocolates back then, <laughs> you might say. This profitable venture continued until Cadbury stopped selling me the chocolates <laughs> from their distribution centre. <laughs> Maybe they had heard about my chocolate meth empire. However, I created a very profitable business and the, the lessons I learnt were invaluable when I started my own company a few, years a few years later when I turned 19. It's very easy to look back at your choices and connect your decisions and opportunities to see how we all arrived here at this moment in time. But what if I told you there was a way to connect them going forward. A way to receive messages forward in time from you in the future. Maybe it's no coincidence I'm talking about this uh, a week after Back to the Future Day. Has anyone here seen the movie Interstellar? Yes, excellent. And so, conversely, uh, <laughs> who hasn't seen Interstellar? Keep your hand up if you would like to see Interstellar. And keep your hand up still if you don't want to be told important plot points that may spoil your enjoyment of the film. <laughs> Excellent. OK, that's great. I'm free. <laughs> OK. Well, I don't have to spoil it, which is great. <laughs> Firstly, it was a fantastic film. So in Interstellar, the main character, now that's Cooper, not Tars, but how awesome was the Tars robot? I mean, I think he was the real star. Um, so, the, so the main character was able to communicate the, uh, with the past by manipulating objects in the present. But what if I told you that your future self can inform your current self of the opportunities that you should be pursuing? I don't mind if you call me crazy, but you see, I think you can. Without going into the theoretical science of how this is even remotely possible, I'm going to ask you to trust me and to trust your future selves. After all, they know you better than you do now. I know that most of you here are a logical bunch, so if it makes you feel better, yes, it is a mental projection of your future self that you have control over. <laughs> it is not where you are now, but where you want to be. Anytime that I'm faced with a decision or opportunity is likely to have an impact in my future, or indeed even coming here today, I visualise my future, older and wiser self who has achieved what I want to achieve. I see that person and think like that person, not like the one you see here now. Once you realise your path in life, all your decisions and opportunities flow towards it, like a stream accelerating towards the end of a waterfall. It really does take the guesswork out of which opportunities you should be seeking on your own personal open journey, and can also provide leadership in your open communities and projects. Trust your future self. Sometimes the paths you need to take may not be obvious. Let your future decide your hard choices for you. After all, they know you better than you do yet. Here's another tip. I also think that your future, your future self, is less interested in you and more interested on the impact that you have on others and the world. There's a great quote from the late Zig Ziglar. 
You can get anything you want out of life if you just help enough people get what they want. It's profound, I think. You can get anything you want out of life if you can just help enough people get what they want. Now, you can't embrace opportunity without being prepared to not always succeed. Failure is part of the process. We don't like to think about it. We should all plan for it. But do any of us actually embrace it? I don't see failure. I see unforeseen opportunities. Sometimes your future might guide you on a path that happens to be a dead end. In most cases, it's the journey that you needed to experience. The destination itself wasn't important. Back in the late 1990s, the internet was more akin to the Wild West. Netscape was king and Alta Vista the prince. Google wasn't even a glint in the eye of Larry and Sergi. During these days, these crazy days, many people were buying and selling domain names for ridiculous amounts. We now know it is cyber squatting and, okay, it's, not, it's totally not cool. However, back then, it was, a, it was a crazy race to grab them and sell them for a profit. I decided to speculate too and grabbed a handful of them. Some I sold, but most I didn't. There was one domain name that stood out from the others, wheatbix.com. <laughs> I received a letter from one of Sanitarium's companies in South Africa, threatening me with legal action if I didn't give them control. I asked them to make me an offer, and, and I called their bluff for a while. They refused to buy the domain name, and I started receiving legal notices from lawyers in Sydney. A friend of mine suggested that I should change my name to wheatbix.com. But as you probably tell, I didn't, uh, and I agreed to let the domain name registration lapse. The end, uh, this ended my interest in speculating in domain names. So the lesson here, don't speculate on domain names. <laughs> yes, it was a failure, but failure can be good. In fact, I'm only here today because of failure or unforeseen opportunity. My business partner and I were seeking funding for a new app project. I brought the management, design, and technical experience to the project, and it was his job to find the funding. Fortunately, he encountered an unforeseen opportunity finding funding in Tasmania, which left me holding the bag. <laughs> so I had to find funding off the island, which led me to meetings with organizations in Canberra. While at Canberra, a friend of mine took me to bar camp an unconference where I spoke about using your tech powers for, so, for good. I had just finished a long run of consulting with the alcoholic beverage industry, and maybe I felt that I needed to atone for my sins. Also speaking at bar camp was the amazing Pia War, GovHack organizer and lead cat herder and open data extraordinaire. And I believe she'll be joining us via video conference later on today. Her inspiring talk was, pick, was Picking Your Battles, which I'll touch on when I talk about scarcity. So I met Pia and ended up attending a GovHack planning meeting at Pia's house the following day. I hadn't heard of GovHack, <laughs> nor I had even heard of the concept of hacking for good, i.e. creating instead of infiltrating. Pia said it was great to have GovHack in Tasmania for the first time. So without really knowing what I was getting myself into, I ran with the idea with bringing GovHack to Tasmania. So at the time, I was uh, still living in Launceston, but I remotely formed a committee on the grounds here, Ground Zero in Hobart. They're all amazing and passionate individuals who, through much collaboration and favor asking, secured a venue, found sponsors and booked caterers and promoted the event. GovHack was born, and lo and behold, seven weeks exactly from the initial meeting with Canberra, with Pia, we had our first GovHack event here in Hobart. And as an added bonus, it was a huge success. <laughs> Tasmania went really well in the national competition, which really put a spotlight on us um, and uh, in the eye of our state government uh, and also state sponsors here. The following year, I was asked to coordinate the rest of the sites around Australia, which for 2014 grew to 12. This year, that grew to 30 locations taking place simultaneously across Australia and New Zealand. However, I was still able to coordinate all of these wonderful teams of volunteers from my beachside headquarters in northwestern Tasmania. And obviously, if it wasn't for GovHack, I wouldn't have the opportunity to speak to you amazing people here today. 
My take-home advice for you is when your future self doesn't quite give you the directions you're expecting, take on board the unforeseen opportunity. You never know what positive paths it could lead you. This leads me to scarcity. It really is hard for us humans to grasp infinity. To imagine, to look up to the sky and stars and realise it's a never-ending, are we there yet, family car trip. This is the stuff of nightmares, my friends. And for those of you who don't have young children, well, I'm sure you sleep soundly anyway, so no nightmares for you anyway. If as humans we have difficulty grasping infinity, you think we'd have a better grasp on scarcity. After all the time and effort, and indeed, even your life, is finite. You need to spend it wisely. We all know this. I mentioned the first time that I saw and heard Pia, that she first, when she first spoke at Bar Camp, about her topic, which was choosing your battles. The overall message of that talk was to avoid waste and movement and energy. Why spend valuable time and resources trying to overcome obstacles when you can take a detour around them? You're all amazing open source developers, each with their own individual and particular talents, passions, and energy. Learn to trust your future self, your own personal vision of success, and learn to own yourself. Being modest is a great virtue, but not acknowledging and owning your amazing individual skills, powers, and potential means that you're not being true to yourself. Knowing that your time, resources, and even your life is a finite quantity is both confronting and refreshing. I think that we all should see life where we place our passions like a great big game of Mario Kart. Mario Kart's weapons are a scarce resource. If you don't know what it is, just go with the flow. These scarce resources need to be respected, appreciated, yet deployed without fear. Some days you will have a red shell, and some days you will have a green shell. But don't be afraid to use them strategically. Your shells are your skills and your tools at your disposal. Use them like a surgeon would use a scalpel. Be precise, but be brave. Sometimes you'll need to improvise. Sometimes you won't have all the resources you need. But learning to use them, to use what you have to the very best of a of your ability is the single best skill of them all. And for any seasoned Mario Kart player would tell you, if you can keep a mushroom on board and engage something akin to the Tesla ludicrous mode just before the finishing line, at this point you are practically unstoppable. This is the confidence you have in yourself and your abilities. Even Elon Musk didn't have unlimited resources when booting Tesla as a company. He had to put his entire personal fortune on the line to purchase a gigantic mushroom that he, had used, that he used before the finishing line that made Tesla the goal-kicking company and open source champions that they are today. Use your resources wisely. Yes to levelling up, no to grinding. Now, although I've focused on my own personal journey, as you'd all be aware, you're not going to go far without collaboration and good leadership. With my management consultant hat on, I've had the good fortune to guide organisations and companies along a positive path with collaborative method methodologies and business to solve business and organisational problems. Sounds very wanky. However, I certainly don't have all the answers, but that is okay. I may ask some of the right questions, but it's it only together and through effective collaboration with community and stakeholders that long-lasting solutions to problems will be solved. There's an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Ooh, I might just cancel that. GovHack relies on effective collaboration and a belief in the awesomeness of community. And that's what drives its success. I will leave you with one final personal story on community, collaboration, and opportunity. For GovHack last year, each of the 12 GovHack sites were given a 3D printer. Even though the Tasmanian event was in Hobart, 
I decided it would be best to keep the northwest region, uh, keep the printer in the northwest region of the state, as there are already a thriving makerspace community down here um, that has its own gear at the Hobart Hackerspace, which we probably have a few people from here today. Can we have a show of hands? Good stuff. The 3D printer we were given was a build-it-yourself one, consisting of many bolstered pieces held together with screws and cable ties. Lacking the mechanical skills and time, I convinced uh, an electronics te technician that his evenings were lacking a project of this caliber. Many, 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 many hours later, so I'm told, <laughs> it was built. The 3D printer was nearly a proof of concept device, but it was good enough to get the interest of the local newspaper, The Advocate, uh, which were gracious enough to cover OSDCon uh, yesterday. They ran an article about GovHack and expressed my interest in starting our own makerspa makerspace on Tasmania's northwest coast. From that article, many people indicated to me their interest in supporting such a group. Together, an automation specialist, a local soft software developer, and myself decided to form the Northwest Makers and Innovators. Through the local contacts and relationships, the group was able to form a partnership with the University of Tasmania, who provided us a dedicated location with after-hours access called the Collab Lab. They also provided equipment, including a MakerBot 3D printer, a fair bit better than the, than the previous one you'd seen, uh, a, a computerized CNC router, Oculus Rifts, Arduinos, Raspberry Pis, and other assorted tech goodies. We recently had our first open days, and have already had guests from the CSIRO and UTAS come and deliver workshops and information sessions. And all this wouldn't have started if it wasn't for taking advantage of small opportunities and turning them into real-world positive outcomes through community collaboration. So here's a full, fully open source 3D printer uh, designed and built by the CSRO's Dr. Andrew Davey, who traveled uh, from Hobart uh, to the Northwest uh, to give a workshop in 3D printing. In closing, I'd like to give you the following five take home points in your OSDCon doggy bag of awesomeness and can consume later when you get home in the comfort of your own life and get ready to redeploy the Mario Kart style when the situation arises. Trust and believe in your future self. This is your life now and in the future. Own it. Help others achieve their goals. Remember, you can get anything you want out of life if you just help enough people get what they want. Embrace opportunities, both foreseen and unforeseen. And pick your battles and use your weapons wisely. Follow your passions and collaborate. As you go through your open journey to create a better world, be true to yourself and your community. Stay open, stay awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. That was inspiring. Um, he's running away. <laughs> we have to give you this gift for oh, presenting. Of course, of course. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> My future self told me it's a wooden box with a drawer. <laughs> spooky. Very spooky. Um, I, we, we do actually, do you do you happy to take questions? We do actually have time if anybody would like to. Um, Or not. <laughs> Here we go. Thank you. All right. So in the um, sort of um, hacker and hackathons type place, GovHack's been one of the big ones recently. Um, what other sort of community stuffs going on, say through the um, through the shared collab spaces around Australia, as well as corporate data sets? Is there any sort of um, movement in that scene for sort of communities? Awesome. Testing one, two. There's lots of, of I guess, pockets of, uh, of hackathons that are coming towards, you know, that organisations, even uh, government departments actually want to start getting in, involved in. Um, a lot of it's even internal hackathons. There's been a real push for that. Um, it's, there's no overarching sort of um, coordination of those 
things though. So um, from that point of view, I guess that they've a lot in the writing on the coattails of other successful hackathons, not just GovHack, but HealthHack and, and other things like that. So, um, but from a coordination point of view and, and knowing about them all, um, they're sort of, I guess, their own individual sort of yeah, groups. So uh, does that sort of answer you? Yeah. <laughs> Paul. Cool, thanks. Um, and it's really, it, you know, I think a lot of people who are about our age will really sort of resonate with that story of getting to the computer lab and you know, getting the time to, ha to, to actually play around with the computers and uh, learn them and, and uh, you know, learn, to, learn to type quickly and do assignments and so forth. But do you think that now the age of pre sort of shrink wrapped devices, game consoles, Windows, uh, where you know it's difficult to get a, um, a, a command prompt and actually tr typing in a program requires lots of resources and money and so forth. Do you think that's sort of stifling a generation of people who, who want, have the inspiration but don't have the means to, to try things out? I think this is probably where it's really important, um, like the talk that we had uh, yesterday, uh, <clears throat> about bringing it down to much more basic parts and actually probably getting the hardware involved, uh, little, those little Edwinos, little caterpillary things. The reason being is that you actually then still have the opportunity to only go down to that level of, of programming um, and not taking everything for granted. Not everything's like a, a shrink wrap product, like you were saying. So I think from that point of view that, uh, yeah, of course, I think they're all spoiled. <laughs> but, um, you know, the previous generations would have thought we were spoiled for, for things too. So I think that, uh, but if we can sort of peel it back to, I guess, the core principles of, you know, what makes things work, um, it really opens up uh, you know, uh, the opportunity for, for children to get engaged and, and sort of understand that sort of creative process. Because it is a creative process. That's what most people think. Like, oh, it's a technical one. Well, yeah, but it's also very, very creative. So I think that uh, you know it unlocks so many levels. Um, so I think that uh, it really only sort of starts to form when you when you go back to the roots. Um, and there's no more. I'd like to thank you again, and I sincerely no hope that uh, my future self and your future self can do this again sometime. I'm sure, I'm sure they will. Right. Thanks, Jim. <laughs>